Well, thank you everybody for joining Hydroterra today for another one of our webinars. Today, our topic is for goodness sake, don't forget about your landfill gas. It's a really interesting topic and I've been chatting with Dr. Victoria Mackay, who's our presenter today about all these things in landfill gas extraction systems that I was unaware of. So I think you'll enjoy the topic today. Before we get started, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. I also pay my respects to their elders past and present. So a little bit about our presenter today. So Victoria, thank you very much for joining us. Victoria has got an interesting background. I've just been hearing a fair bit about it. Originally from New Zealand, Victoria, Victoria has done a lot of studies. She's done three degrees, a Bachelor of Science in Toxicology in New Zealand and an Honours in Medicinal Chemistry also in New Zealand. Then Victoria embarked on a PhD and that topic was organic chemistry and, pro and production chemicals for sensing cancer. I think I got that right, Victoria. That was uh, undertaken largely in California. And uh, at the end of that, Victoria returned to Australia and worked in agriculture for a while, doing studies into residual chemicals in agriculture before seeing the light and uh, moving into the world of waste, which is really the topic of today's discussion. So really in terms of her early career in waste, uh, uh, Victoria cut her teeth in the Bundaberg Regional Council and uh, spent several years there as a senior technical officer. She's recently joined LGI Limited as a technician in the landfill gas management space, and Victoria uses her practical experience in waste and her scientific background to develop and deliver strategies and improvement programs that ensure the environmental assets are protected and sustainably managed. Um, I would say that uh, Victoria has a wealth of knowledge on these uh, landfill gas extraction systems based on my discussions today and also a broad knowledge of some of the programs in place around how they can be monetized. So without further ado, oh, before I do that, um, I will now move on to a little bit of guidance for you on how you can raise questions. We love your questions. Um, and thanks very much for everyone who provides questions during these webinars. To place a question, just use the Q&A button at the top of your screen and type in your questions. And I will read those questions out to Victoria and we will try collectively to answer them to the best of our ability. Thank you also for all those early bird questions. We've just about got a record of early bird questions for this one. We've got uh, 12 early bird questions. So we will be doing those first, of course, um, before moving on to the other questions. A little bit about why Hydroterra runs these webinars. We're very passionate about sharing knowledge and there's some great knowledge that we will be learning today. Uh, we also like to facilitate education. We feel that um, in the industry at the moment, training is lagging behind. And uh, this is one way for us to help facilitate some training of those people in the industry. And finally, we like to be an industry leader, identifying new technologies and how they can be applied. And there's no better way to do that than to actually get people from the industry who are trying to solve problems to tell us what they need. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Dr. Victoria Mackay for your presentation. Thanks very much, Richard, and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, 
just wanted to come here today to start talking about local gas and uh, get it to the forefront of everybody's minds. Um, first thing I want you all to do is have a think about the number of times in the past year that you visited your community library or your community pool, you know, your parks and hospitals, and now think about how often you've used your landfill. And the answer is probably going to be every week. So we have um, this interconnectivity with our landfill, but we really struggle to get our community to recognize how important the landfill is in the piece and these services that we provide. We um, are doing really great things um, working towards resource recovery and the resource recovery space, but we need to make sure we take our best practice landfill management on that journey too. So if you're trying to find um, something engaging to start talking about your community about landfills and getting them interested in landfill management, landfill gas is a great place to start. We can go to the next slide. So I guess the first thing we sort of need to address is well, what is the issues around landfill gas? So landfill gas, as you know, is generated by three, three processes. So you have your bacterial degradation of your organic wastes um, uh, within your landfill cell. Landfills also generate a partial pressure. So if you have volatile um, wastes in there, they will also volatilize within the landfill. Then you have uh, gases that can be created from the presence of uh, wastes that actually react and mix within the landfill. So it's quite a, quite a mixture of gases that are produced. Within that complex mixture of gases, methane is your predominant um, gas that's in there. So your bacterial degradation predominates um, when your landfill converts from anaerobic to, uh, sorry, aerobic to anaerobic conditions. So why is methane such an issue? We know that it's a colorless and odorless gas. Um, methane itself is uh, flammable and explosive. So when you get methane levels between sort of five to 15% of your atmospheric levels, it is explosive. Um, but I think the key here is that methane has a global warming potential of 28 times that of CO2. So it's 28 times um, better at retaining heat in the atmosphere than if you had a molecule of CO2. Now, as everybody is well aware, climate change is a, is a very big factor in use and, and uh, in our environment at the moment. So looking at the scale of that, that's great. So 50% of your landfill gas is methane, but what does that actually look like in terms of total volume? So for a, an average council, you're probably looking between 40 to 65% of all of the emissions within all aspects of the council are actually from landfill gas, from the methane and landfill gas. So that pie chart really sort of clearly shows you that big red chunk is your landfill gas. Now that is an opportunity. That is an opportunity to do a, a very simple thing to immediately enact greenhouse gas emissions reductions. So the government has, um, has recognized this and there are funding mechanisms in place. So we are able to utilize the emissions reduction fund. They have a landfill gas method for generating Australian carbon credit units. So that's your ACCUs. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of landfill gas, uh, sorry, a lot of landfill licenses don't specifically speak to landfill gas at the moment. And that is where the, uh, the, the marrying of the Emissions Reduction Fund and the Environmental Licensing sort of sits. With the Emissions Reduction Fund, there is this requirement for additionality to participate in the, in the fund. So whatever you're doing you have to actually um, be uh, abating carbon at a level greater than what you would have had to do otherwise on a regulatory basis. So if you don't have anything in your license around landfill gas, um, start now, now is the time. Uh, next slide, if you don't mind. So what does it actually mean to manage your landfill gas? Why are we doing it? Um, so obviously there's the greenhouse um, gas emissions reduction, 
But if you install a landfill gas extraction system, you're also working a way to reduce the odours that your landfill is producing. Um, we do this because we actually put a vacuum on the landfill cell. So there's less risk of fugitive emissions um, from your landfill. Installations of landfill gas um, extraction systems also uh, can be utilised on um, landfills that are closed. So we're dealing with the legacy waste issue that we currently have with these systems. If your landfill is suitable for an emissions reduction fund project, um, so that's where you can either upgrade an existing system or you can install a new system. Um, the installation of that can be funded by the generation of these ACCUs that you get when you participate in these, these um, emissions reduction uh, schemes. So this actually means that you could have a landfill gas system extraction system um, put onto your landfill for low to no cost to most operators. And if you have a landfill that's sort of active and, and um, continuing to grow, there might be an opportunity that you can actually generate revenue in addition. So it can be a source of passive revenue. Um, Victoria, just a question. Mm. You said if your site is eligible, how do people actually work out if their site is eligible? So these um, some conditions that are published within the method, um, they particularly sit around whether there is already a requirement within the license or a regulation that says that you must be um, capturing and managing your landfill gas. So if you have that in there, it doesn't immediately disqualify you. What it means is that you need to be doing more, you need to be chasing the gas. So there is the opportunity for an upgrade project. Um, so that's where you can do improvements to your current landfill gas system. Um, you can make operational improvements, you can add wells. Um, and that means that most projects, almost all projects are eligible. Um, you can just have a look on the Clean Energy Regulators website to uh, see if you fit into those categories. If I own a site now and I just wanted to engage someone, do they engage, you know, your standard environmental consultants or is there a... Do they come straight to contractors um, like yourselves? What's the, what's the best? There's, there's a lot of different ways to, um, a lot of different ways to, to manage uh, landfill gas systems. So depending on what the requirements are, I'm, I'm going to say councils here because they're usually the people who are most involved in um, landfill operations. So depending on the procurement requirements of your council, uh, there's different mechanisms. So within Queensland, um, a lot of landfill gas extraction providers are on the local by panels, so you can directly engage uh, a landfill gas specialist. Uh, if you want to go for a tender process, you can do that. There are a lot, a number of really great consultants out there who work in the landfill gas space who can assist a council to put together a tender. Um, one of the things I would highly encourage you to do is just talk to your landfill gas expert um, and get them out to do a site. And it's very, very important because landfill gas systems are really reliant on the, condition, the site conditions uh, and to understand how much gas your landfill will actually generate, there might be some modelling involved as well. All right. Thanks, Victoria. I might let you get back to the, <laughs> the next slide. Um, I'll, I'll finish off this one. So there is... Um, there's also uh, something important to recognise is that the, the emissions reduction fund projects, um, the generation of the ACCUs, the installation of the landfill gas extraction system with flaring actually can underwrite um, the ability to put a power station on. So once you understand how your gas flows are uh, occurring in your landfill and how much you're going to be able to extract, you can do an assessment to see if your gas flow can support um, a beneficial, uh, a beneficial gas uh, um, destruction system such as you know, an engine or um, a gas turbine. So that's actually producing renewable gas uh, from the, uh, sorry, renewable energy from the landfill gas. And that can be fed back into the power grid, which from those you can generate large uh, generation certificates. 
you're producing renewable power, green renewable power, and also it's dispatchable. So you can use your uh, landfill like a sponge and when the grid has high uh, peak demand times, you can ramp up your energy production um, just to help supply energy to the grid, provide stability. And I think another space that's very important to recognise is that the ACCUs that are generated from landfill gas, um, they're immediate. So the carbon abatement occurs the moment you pull the gas out and put it through uh, a flare or an engine and destroy that gas, you oxidise it to carbon dioxide. Um, in terms of carbon abatement, it's irreversible. You know, you, you might grow a tree and it might fall down and die, or you might cut it down, but you can't undo oxidation of methane to carbon dioxide very easily. Um, and, and it's also nice to think about the fact that with landfill gas, you can put a flow meter on it, you can actually measure your abatement very accurately. So you can guarantee that those carbon credits that you're, you're buying to offset your, um, your current emissions profile, they come from tangible um, carbon abatement. So we, we can roll over. So I guess the, the question that comes up now is, like, is why isn't everybody doing this? Why haven't we jumped on this? And I think that there's a, a little bit of um, a lack of recognition about how, how rapid and how much landfill, um, landfill gas is generated during the early, uh, early landfilling stages. So at uh, the Australian Landfills Transfer Conference down in Melbourne, um, Stuart Deaver and Nick Simmons got up and they, they put this chart up and it, it really spoke to me because it really indicates that from the modelling, and obviously all modelling is, uh, is flexible, but it tends to sort of speak to the fact that about 30% of your total gas, landfill gas generation can occur before a landfill is closed. So waiting till your landfill is closed to put your infrastructure in, you know, you're losing a massive amount of your resource there. Can we can we flip slides? Oh, sorry, you you cut out there. Do you want to go to the next slide? Yes, please. Sorry. Now, uh, I think it's very very important to remember that while we have these great schemes available to us, they are very dependent on regulation. So the moment that uh, the regulators come out and put some um, changes to the guidance that says that you must do something about your landfill gas is the moment where you are gonna to have to work so much harder to meet that additionality requirement within the method. So it use the opportunity that we have available now um, and chase the gas, put in the best system that you can, um, or we, you, run the risk of having to pay for it yourself. And you know, that's a that's a large burden to bear for a lot of the communities in Australia and the financial times that we're, we're entering into now. And it's very important to, to point out that regulation is coming. You know, the, the New South Wales and Queensland governments have very clearly indicated that they are they have an intention to uh, require active and operating landfills to uh, manage their gas in the future. And does that mean they won't be eligible once that's in place? They won't be eligible to, to claim this? Well, once that's in place, it's going to mean that their baseline is going to be much higher because there's going to be a, a, already have to be a requirement for them to capture a certain amount. And if they want to participate in generating ACCUs, they're going to be doing, have to be doing above and beyond that. Right. So the general environmental duty that's in the EPA it's sort of a, it's an unlimited level of effort that's required. It's not, it's, it's a little bit grey maybe, but it's sort of basically saying to the extent practicable, you've got to avoid pollution. Does, does that aff affect that? It's, it doesn't seem like it's a very clear line to be, do you think there'll be additional regulation that clarifies that for Victoria? I, I believe so. I, I would say that we, we're heading into a space where we 
are starting to understand our capture efficiencies and what would be expected of an average or operating landfill. So, you know, we have had these systems in place for quite a while now, for many, many years. You know, it's not new technology. The government is getting its head around the figures on what we are actually able to capture compared to what we expect our landfills to generate. So once they get more of a sense of that, they're going to be able to put more precise regulation in place. So if someone starts a project tomorrow and it takes them 12 months to uh, get up and going, and the regulation changes in that period, is are they still, because they've commissioned it before the change, does that mean they can claim? Uh, I believe it would be all about project registration and timelines. So uh, in terms of getting a landfill gas project up and running, um, you know, we've, we've been able to instigate and operate landfill gas projects in as little as six months. So things that tend to hold up those timelines usually is the procurement process internally with, within council. Okay. Shall I move to the next slide? Thank you. So how do you actually assess whether your landfill is suitable for a landfill gas extraction system? So I'll pop some rules of thumb um, up on the slide here. Um, I think that the key message to us though is that the technologies have advanced significantly. Um, and if you've had a landfill gas assessment um, on your site, you know, that's more than two years old, um, get another assessment. So with the installation of systems, it's really highly dependent on um, your site conditions and, and the geometry of your cell. So you have to have um, a, a minimum of depth of waste in place to be able to put landfill gas infrastructure in. But apart from that, um, it's the volume of waste um, that we can sort of have a look and predict how much gas is going to be generated and will that support combustion from an active system. But you can put them on both open and closed. So in your working base, um, as well as on closed or interim cap cells as well. Next slide. So what's actually involved in a landfill gas extraction system? Um, I'm not sure if people have been to landfills. You, you don't see a lot from the outside. So I just sort of want to take everybody through um, the infrastructure that you've put in place. So there's three levels of infrastructure within a landfill gas system. Um, so your primary, secondary and tertiary. Your primary infrastructure installations are your actual well heads. Now, those are the perforated pipes that interface with the waste and uh, act to actually capture the gas um, and give it a pathway to feed back to your um, destruction device. So there's two types of um, wells. You've got your vertical wells that can be placed into uh, closed cells, into legacy landfills and closed cells, also into inactive cells. So if you're in an area and you've finished it, you've popped your interim capping on, then you go and uh, put some vertical uh, wells into that area and extract the gas from those areas as well. Vertical wells can be used um, uh, multi-purpose wells, so you can actually use them for leachate reinjection or leachate extraction if you've got very wet um, areas of waste. The important thing with that is to work with your landfill gas contractor um, and your engineers to look at the, the systems and placement of those wells. Um, vertical wells have a, a zone of influence around of waste around the well that it can actually extract the gas from. So uh, the positioning of the wells will uh, relate to this zone of influence as to how many wells per area of waste you're going to need. Um, the uh, vertical wells can also go into your areas of, of active um, filling, but they do need to be mindful of operations as well. So if you have uh, vertical wells, then you do need to be mindful of them when you're doing compaction. So if we can... Up over the next slide. No, not yet for the question. <laughs> so you see, you've got to be mindful of compaction and, and look after them. I'm just trying to visualize how you do this, right? So you've got these vertical wells and you've got trucks coming in and depositing waste uh, for the next lift. 
do you disconnect everything and put extensions on these vertical gas wells as you progressively do the lifts? Is that how that works or? Absolutely. So we extend wells as the lifts go in. Um, we tend to describe it when, when we're talking to the operators as if they put a little volcano of waste around it so that the uh, your loan fill compactor doesn't run over the, the well heads themselves. Then it makes a nice sort of um, safe oper operating area around it. But yes, they're extended vertically until you get to your final height as they go through. And you, you have... Uh... So in the picture you've got there, you've got uh, a slotted section. Do you end up with sort of multiple slotted sections in the verticals as you go up? Multiple slotted sections in the verticals, absolutely. Okay. And the, the gravel pack just keeps getting extended up? You sort of... Case, case gravel pack gravel. gets extended up. The gravel pack um, allows for movement of gas and prevents a lot of sediment from flowing back into the blocking the uh the well perforations okay all right we can move on now thanks <laughs> so the, the second type of uh, primary um, level installations are your lateral wells so um, lateral wells are preferred for areas of active filling um, they have a, a, a much wider zone of influence, so they're really effective um, at gas capture. And how the lateral wells tend to work is you will finish a lift and then your gas contractor will come in and trench into that um, and then lay the, the lateral lines. Then you will come back and put your next lift of waste on. And once you have sufficient depth of waste above and below your lateral line um, to prevent air ingress into the, the um, system, then a vacuum will be applied. The great thing about lateral lines is you, you can get them into the waste and get them on nice and early. You don't have to wait till you've got to a final height or an interim capping stage before you can place vacuum on them. Lateral lines can have vacuum applied to both sides, so they get a very effective um, vacuum on an area of waste. You don't end up suffering from loss of vacuum across the length of the, the well. Uh, one of the really key things to understand about uh, the installation of landfill gas systems is that you want it in and you want it in early. Um, when you are considering setting up a contract for a landfill gas installation, um, particularly around council procurement timeframes, is quite often your landfill gas contractor will suggest or prefer an own, um, a build own operate type structure because as we know, landfill active faces move around all the time. And if we want to be getting infrastructure in and active as soon as possible, it, a lot of councils don't have the, um, the capital available to just pop one of these lines in as soon as a, an area of waste has moved, you know, active faces move somewhere else. In terms of the that actual installation, it's, how, how wide a, a trench are you putting it in? Uh, you can see the uh, the trenching there in the photo. So it's not a huge amount of um, trenching that's oh, required. Yeah. 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 We're so. all allowed one silly question everywhere <laughs> in Victoria. <laughs> I was looking at the drawing. All right. Shall we move to the next slide? Thank you. So your secondary infrastructure um, are your flow lines. Now, flow lines take... Uh, the consolidated flow from a series of wells um, that are all pulled together to a manifold point and then uh, they distribute the gas um, back to whatever your combustion device is. So flow lines are very important because you have to consider the movement and settlement of the waste mass as you go. So your designer will look at um, the nature of the flow lines and may you may end up with surface flow lines or you may end up with subsurface flow lines depending on the fall that is required. Um, there's a couple of different ways to set up your flow lines. You can have a branch system which is uh, similar to the picture um, on the, the diagram there. Um, if you want to where you've got a central main line going back to a point, the Considerations for design on these types of systems is the, lo uh, the loss of vacuum across the length of the system. 
can I fix slides? Is, is that numerically modeled or how do you do that? That is down to the designers, which um, I, I take my hat off to the engineering designers within our business. They, they will do all the numbers. Okay. Uh, so the other option for your flow lines and your, your main lot is to go out to a ring main. So having a ring main on a landfill system, land gas system means that you would uh, equalizing the vacuum that's delivered to all of your flow lines. So you suffer a lot less from um, the, the issue of distance and vacuum applied. Um, one of the other good points with the uh, main lines is that if you have a failure, it's a lot easier to troubleshoot and you will still have vacuum um, applied to the system if you get a blockage in a, in a certain area. They do add a little bit more um, cost to a label gas system, uh, but they do uh, result in a very effective um, delivery of vacuum to a site. With your ring mains, it's really important to work with your designers um, and sorry, your landfill gas designers and your engineering consultants to look at the location of those ring mains. If they're sitting at the toe of the battle, they suffer a lot less from uh, differential sediment issues as well. You get a lot less surging as a result of quantum state in the lines. Um, so what actually causes surging in a landfill gas system with the vacuum um, is condensate, obviously. So as landfill gas is extracted from a warm, damp environment, the pressure and temperature changes as you go from the inside of the waste mass out to the surface means that you get uh, the moisture um, condensing within the, the, the landfill gas pipes and main lines and flow lines. Um, so that also brings contaminants up and it forms pools of liquid. So your system needs maintenance and it needs to be managed to ensure that when your differential settlement happens, you don't get bowing in your flow lines or your main lines because your condensate will then drain down and pull and block the ability of vacuum to reach your manifolds. So they're not set and forget systems. You do have to actively manage them. Um, what we do to look out for uh, condensate buildup within our flow lines and, and main lines is there are these type of systems here. So you put condensate traps in. So there's examples of P traps, J traps, and also uh, you can use barometric traps as well. So those allow uh, condensate to drain out of the system um, and prevent blocking and searching. What, what, uh, when would you choose which particular one to use? What, what's the plus? Um, <laughs> It all really depends on, that really depends on your, your contractor and how they prefer to build the different components within their system. Um, so therefore with the experience of your contractor will assist you in working out how many of these traps you need um, and the type of trap that's suitable for, for the region that you're putting it in. Once you've set up, uh, is it pretty hard to go and retrofit these things or? Are they often retrofitted later? Um, they can be retrofitted later, absolutely. Um, it all depends on whether you've had to put your flow lines uh, subsurface or um, if you've been able to lay them on the surface for fault finding purposes. Yeah. All right, next slide. Now, I'm, I'm only going to touch a little bit on the the, the uh, destruction units um, other than to say so you've put your your landfill gas system um, infrastructure system under vacuum and that vacuum is generated by a blower that is part of your gas skid um, so your uh, landfill gas flaring skid has uh, a condensate management apparatus it'll have a blower it'll have the burner the stack unit and all the safety and control systems there Despite that, they don't actually take up a huge amount of room. So there's a, a nice picture there kind of indicating the, the size that's required to actually have a, a flare. Flares come in a range of sizes. So you can get ones for low flow uh, situations for particularly closed landfills or small landfills. Um, and then they can go right up to sort of a 2,000 kit per hour system. So they can be very large. 
um, your flares are necessary if you're looking to uh, generate power on a site because you're looking to um, confirm your flow and your methane content of your system. So quite often a landfill gas system will start off with the infrastructure in the ground connected to a flare. Then you'll run your flare for a period of time to understand how much flow you're actually going to be able to achieve. And then from there, you'll be able to justify the ability to have a power station on the site as well. Um, there's no flame in an enclosed flare stack. So uh, in terms of community involvement, all you can see is a nice sort of hazy um, stack output. Next slide. So those flare systems, are they leased to the site operator or do they purchase them outright? What's the model that you... Use so there's, um, there's a lot of different models around that. Um, there's a few flare manufacturers. Um, you can look at either whether you want to own a flare, um, rent a flare, or you can have your landfill gas uh, system owned, operated and managed by your landfill gas contractor. Um, in terms of the management of a flare, they are a specialist piece of kit. Uh, and if you are go, a council were looking to own a flare, you have to sort of remember that they do take a considerable amount of maintenance and management um, and to ensure that you have the capacity to do the maintenance and the monitoring uh, to make sure they're, they're burning efficiently um, and they are meeting their destruction requirements. When you say considerable amount of maintenance, what are we talking well, about? So it's, it's really management um, in terms of the, the flare has to be managed in line with the gas field. So the tuner will come and look at the requirements of, of the gas inputs that the flare needs to support combustion. And then they will tune the field. So they go out to the manifold stations. Um, you have to remember that the, the waste mass is not a consolidated single amount of waste that all went into the ground at the same time. So it's all in different stages of gas production, depending on the age and the types of waste, uh, convection waste in the, the, the cell. So each of your wells is going to be producing a slightly different composition of gas. So we go out and tune the field um, based on the requirements of the flare. So in terms of maintenance, you've got to maintain your gas flows to the the flare. Okay, so it's as much about the composition coming into the flare as looking after the flare itself. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Yes, please. Then we sort of turn our attention to the actual beneficial uses of the gas. So in our um, in our preferential triangle for resource recovery, um, we all know that if you can do something with your waste stream as opposed to just doing the conversion, that's really where we want to be. We want to take the energy out of the gas and use it for something. So uh, if you are able to support more than just a flare, um, there's a number of options. You can use your landfill gas to power uh, internal reciprocating engines, internal combustion engines, gas turbines, um, you can use that to charge generators to send electricity to the network. Um, there's some very smart people who have started putting battery systems onto the landfill gas capture, which uh, is excellent for grid stability because you can continue capturing your landfill gas, maintain that energy, and then send it to the network when the network requires it. So you're really stabilizing that. Um, there's heat recovery systems and you can use the gas, um, they're starting to look at green gas capture and, and um, purification of the landfill gas streams, then uh, reuse of that methane into the gas network in the form of liquefied natural gas or um, compressed natural gas as well. So there's a lot going on in the space of beneficial landfill gas usage. You think we're getting better at extracting the gas? Is it a bit like sort of the coal seam gas industry where they've perfected getting more out or has the technology stayed the same for the last 20 odd years? I just remember there used to be a facility out at Springvale that was hooked up to power and, um, you know, has it changed much over that 30 year period or? 
It's changed immensely. Um, there's a number of sites where we have gone and uh, introduced upgrade projects under the Emissions Reduction Fund um, and introduced new technologies that have improved our gas capture, you know, we've doubled, doubled our gas capture on some of the sites. So some of the improvements that we've made is uh, definite improvements to flare configurations. Um, so we can run flares on less gas than we used to be able to. So more smaller projects are viable these days than they used to be. Um, we've also uh, got new technologies available. So we have what's called a siloxane removal system. Um, so that's introduced within your gas conditioning skin. Uh, that removes almost 99 almost 99.8% of the siloxanes in the, uh, the gas, uh, landfill gas stream. So siloxanes uh, come from a lot of products that are put into the landfills like soaps and, and shampoos and, and things like that. Siloxane in, a, in an engine is uh, terrible, gums up the, the pistons and creates a lot of maintenance requirements. So if you clean your gas before you put it into your engine, you're lowering your maintenance costs and you're making these engines much more efficient and economical to run. So the projects become much more viable. What would the, just roughly like the value of that system there we've got in front of us, what sort of money is involved in setting up something that big? Um, look, the, Thing that makes these systems financially viable is not only the, the ACCU generation from the um, greenhouse gas capture, but uh, selling um, renewable energy into the grid. These systems also generate the, um, the large generation certificates for displacing um, coal or um, coal fired power in the network with renewables. And so there's that balance between the, um, the systems available to, to fund them and, and actually getting these installed. Yeah. And yes, there's lots of zeros on the end. <laughs> I figured there might be. But these are, you know, they're, in the end, they're making money out of these investments. Um, next slide. Um, oh. Yes. Um, so I guess the, the question that we see a lot is, oh boy, that looks complicated. I'm not sure I'm ready to handle that. Um, and I, I want to put the challenge out to everybody is that there, you've got your, your landfill gas expert to help. So give, people, give us a call. Um, there's some great companies all around Australia who do this. Um, they are more than willing to help you and support you. Talk to your procurement people. There's some excellent consultants, engineers, um, and there's some great, uh, uh, great consultants who specific, specifically sit in that landfill gas space there that are there to support you to get through these processes. And if we can flick over, I think we've got a... a, a a message from the Mayor of Gympie, which is a, a region in Queensland who was just talking about his landfill gas system and what it means to his community. All right, let's hear him. What are you waiting for? I mean, it's not rocket science. Your landfill produces gas. It either goes uncontrolled into the atmosphere or you partner with a, an appropriate um, company to deal with that and, and actually reduce your greenhouse gas emissions the toxic nature of the gases that are released in an appropriate manner. And I mean, I, I don't know what you say to someone that can't, can't get over that hurdle. It's a simple win for us as a council as it's no cost and a, and a hell of a benefit to the environment. So, um, you know, to lay down the there, it should be done. Well, he sounds convinced, doesn't he, Victoria? <laughs> it's recognising that these, uh, these systems are really they're well, um, they've been used for a long time and we, we've got to get over this hurdle of ensuring that people recognise this landfill gas is an issue that we need to deal with. Um, we can use it as a resource and we can use these opportunities, um, funding opportunities that we have available to get this in, in action now at no or low cost to our communities. So why are we doing it? Hey. If I own a landfill now and I want to 
explore this is that the best thing for them to just reach out to yourself in the first instance is that what we're saying and then you'll be able to introduce them to a team of different people and consultants that could help them go through that exercise is that absolutely um we tend to do a lot of um a lot of talks to to counselors and to the people who make the the higher end decisions and sort of give them this background on why it's so important to have these systems in place um, and the importance of using the the funding mechanisms now before they they are uh, out of place by the regulation that's coming. Is there any funding available for doing feasibility assessments? I'm not 100% sure on that one. Um, it would be something that would be great if, if you know, the, the uh, regulator is looking at making this a requirement. You know, maybe they can support councils and, and look at and uh, having these fun pools of funding for feasibility studies for, for councils. Your landfill gas provider has a lot of expertise in this area and we have uh, modelling available that we can be fairly, fairly confident um, in, you know, giving you a range of potential uh, gas production rates and, you know, what you could potentially look at doing and then integrating into, into your program of works. So if I want to get a feasibility study done, I'd contact yourselves and then do you get independent consultants involved or that would be the site operators um, would go off and do that separate once you've done your feasibility study? So there's, there's, a, there's multiple options. Um, you can engage a consultant directly. Um, companies, landfill gas companies will quite often be able to do a desktop study for you once if you can supply them with some information. Um, the government has a, a, a calculator that is available um, that we will use to, to look at what your potential landfill gas emissions rates are and then your gas provider will be able to see if they can match that to the um, infrastructure and equipment available to, to manage your gas there. But it's really it's really up to the, the councils as to what their preferred pathway is. Yeah. All right. So in terms of the only thing that really matters in the world is monitoring, of course, for <laughs> um, would you like to talk briefly to this slide and then we better move to the Q&A side of things pretty quickly after this, I think. So landfill gas uh, monitoring is exceptionally important in our world um, and it sits really at every level of, of our operations. Uh, so we have uh, personal gas monitoring when our staff are out on site. So quite often um, you can have your manifolds and, and your stations actually subsurface. So it ends up being in a closed space. So we have to make sure that it's safe for our personnel to, to go in there. Um, we have monitoring at many different levels throughout the gas extraction process um, for quite a few different reasons. So we monitor at the wellhead, we look at the gas composition. Um, so different ages and different compositions of waste will be producing different balances of um, CO2 to methane. What we're trying to do is collect all of those different balances of methane and deliver it to our, our flaring or our energy generation station at uh, the correct uh, ratio for the type of combustion that you're trying to target. Um, we also need to measure our flows. So that's done through differential pressure at the wellhead. Um, we have to monitor our engines for performance and our systems for performance. So we're looking at um, our NOx generation levels and how much oxygen fuel balance. So we have uh, engine monitoring as well. We also have to monitor our condensate collection levels um, and you know, particularly if we're using automated systems to deliver condensate back into the landfills or to treatment plants, treatment plants. And then there's a lot of the uh, requirements for the environmental monitoring, such as your, your boundary monitoring and your fugitive emissions as well. Very good. Um, might just go straight, uh, just skip over this slide probably. So there's a range of uh, guidance documentation that you can um, source for further information. 
Um, these webinars are recorded and put on to our website, so feel free to have a look at those guidelines separately. Um, obviously, there's a range of equipment such as portable and inline sensors um, that are utilised as well. So thank you very much, Victoria. That was actually really, really interesting. A couple of sort of key lessons learnt that um, I think worth reiterating. That land for gas extraction can occur as early as end of first lift. So that was a learning for myself. So you don't need to wait for your cap to be on these landfill cells. As soon as you've got your first lift in, there's, uh, there's a bit of an imperative to really get in there and start grabbing that gas as it's generated to minimise the losses. Um, there's a lot of work associated with achieving optimum function of these things and monitoring is a big part of that. I was surprised at how much of it's still done manually. Um, the that that monitoring data is is important in terms of understanding the gas composition but also the moisture this moisture in the gas creates quite a lot of technical challenges both from a monitoring perspective and also for the, the function of the flares etc um good communication is essential we've sort of i've been trying to tease out um, from victoria the the process that uh, you need to go through to get this up and going um, but it does require a lot of communication between the site operators themselves, the landfill gas managers like Victoria and consulting engineers. So there's a bit of a crossover. There's a need for really good collaboration there to have a successful project. Importantly, there are financial incentives. These things don't have to cost people money in terms of over the the life of the project and they are good for the environment so really uh, we heard from the mayor of Gympie I think it was that uh, it's a bit of a no-brainer we should really uh, get on and be doing this um, also good monitoring is always critical in everything you do um, but particularly if you're trying to prove that you are actually reducing your greenhouse gas emissions so a lot of learnings there, and I thought that was fantastic. Without further ado, we're going to charge into our questions. Okay, and thank you very much for the early bird questions. You now have the benefit of going first. We, Victoria, we have a lot of questions in front of us, and we've still got a lot of people here on the webinar. Um, it's likely to run for probably an extra half an hour, I would think. Um, presume that's okay with you. Um, if not, speak up. <laughs> um, so the first question, can biochar be used to help reduce methane emissions from landfill? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. Um, I guess we can kind of look at it up. I wonder whether we are talking about the use of biochar uh, within a capping system. Um, or whether we're sort of looking at the, the concept of using activated carbon as a filter within an inline um, gas stream. So I guess in, in terms of the, the capping, that um, you know, the concept of using biochar uh, to oxidize the gas is, is there is definite potential there. Um, I guess in terms of a landfill gas extraction system that's actively uh, under vacuum, We've got to remember that if you've got your, your system under vacuum, most of the gases should be coming toward the system as opposed to out through the cap. So there may be a place for it in the future. I definitely would love to see some, some studies on, on how that uh, reduces emissions. Um, in terms of if we were looking at using activated carbon within an inline filter, um, one of the key issues with that is probably the moisture content um, that, that landfill gas is usually sitting at with the condensate. All right, good answer. Question number two. This is all about monitoring this one. Evaluating performance of gas extraction. Distance of observation bores to assess effectiveness, 
placement and design of the and diameter of those bores. Mm. Do you want to have a run at that one or? Oh, you can go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I will have to say that I'm, I'm not particularly an expert on the boundary monitoring the distances. There has there are some very, very good um, documents that have been produced already by the, uh, the regulators around the country. So um, things like your, your BIPM, I think you had a reference to a few of those documents, you, the BIPM in Victoria and the landfill gas guidelines in, um, in uh, New South Wales that talk to observation boards. Um, there are a lot of uh, really good guidance documents and I think if you were looking at uh, assessing that, you'll probably want to go to see those ones first. Sorry, I misunderstood the question maybe, but I thought they were angling more for not so much the sort of compliance monitoring side of things, but more, I guess, the extent of the vacuum that's being achieved was um, uh, what I how I read that, but I might be wrong. But performance of gas extraction in the sense of capture as distinct from identifying whether or not there was fugitive emissions is similar, but mm -hmm. how do you sorry that? Ooh, that's a that is a that's a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are uh, uh, models that are published around um, the generation and capture efficiency. Um, we tend to find that there's a little bit of a um, little bit of a misalignment between the models and what we see in real life in terms of uh, the complexity of the model because you have to take into account uh, that it's mixed waste that is put into the landfill uh, at different time frames. So you might have a profile of waste that's um, it, with a single ball through it that has very old waste at the bottom and very fresh waste at the top. Each of those different levels of waste are producing quite different gas compositions. So um, understanding and predicting what, how much gas each well should be receiving is very, very complex. Um, when we monitor at the well heads, what we're really doing is trying to ensure that we are extracting what we would expect to be extracting from that well um, based on the models that we have available. Um, and tune into our field conditions. We would also be looking to ensure that the gas composition isn't indicating that something else is going on in the waste. So for instance, if you are overdrawing a well um, and you pull uh, oxygen in, that conversion from anaerobic to aerobic is actually exothermic. So you can heat up an area of waste. Um, and if you're supplying it with heat and oxygen, you can start fires underground. So uh, when you're producing uh, landfill fires, landfill fires obviously produce gases and it will change the gas mix that you receive at the well hit. So monitoring isn't just looking at capture efficiency, it's also looking, trying to understand um, what's actually going on within the waste mass around that well as well. If you do create an internal fire, can you claim the uh, accuse on that? <laughs> Uh, if it's producing combustible gases, I, I suppose you would be claiming accused for flow. <laughs> Might be hard to verify. All right, mm. question number three. How do the design, construction and validation regulatory requirements in Victoria compare to those in the rest of Australia? So I, I myself have worked mostly um, in the sort of the, the Queensland, New South Wales area. Um, Victoria has the, the BEPM as its guidance and that's sort of um, treated by the industry as really kind of a gold standard. It's a very good document for, for landfill gas management. Okay, now we've got those guidance documents in the slides as well for people to have a look at. Yes, uh, yes. Question number four, more a comment. The carbon mapper project can be used by the general public and regulators to see point sources of greenhouse gases, including landfill. Are you familiar with that carbon mapper project? Yeah, so the, the carbon mapper project is, it's a really interesting um, sort of concept 
and we're seeing more and more of these services that are using uh, things like satellites and drone and plane technology to um, assist point sources of, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I, I guess you, you sort of have to take into consideration there's around about sort of 30 landfills in the country that accept uh, 75 to 80% of all waste that's generated because it's really those ones that are situated around um, large population spaces. So um, I'm sure that for the large landfills that are generating a lot of methane, because they're accepting a lot of waste, you know, they um, might pop up on these carbon mapper projects. I'm just not sure um, the sensitivity of, of these analyses for, say, smaller landfills or landfills that are closed, but it would be really interesting to see how uh, going forward the technology improves to, to sort of see these smaller sites. Because I know as, a, as somebody who's worked regionally, there are a lot of landfills out there that um, are not regulated because they were in place a long, a long time ago. And you only know about them because the old mate Steve at the pub said that once upon a time he used to use the old landfill down on Pine Creek Road. Yeah, there's plenty of them around. Um, mm. I was wondering with the carbon mapper, if you have got one of your gas extraction systems on it, then it's no longer on that register. Is that right? It would come off. Not 100% sure. I have to have to look at what um, limitations they're putting on, on those systems. All right. Next question. Would like to know if sacrificial horizontal gas collection is happening in Australia. If so, where? Is it beneficial from cost? So um, this is a really good question. Um, this is looking at those two, two types of primary infrastructure where you can put a well vertically in, a ground, in the ground or you could go horizontally across a lift. Um, obviously, uh, we've been improving our technologies as we go along because you know, theoretically it's much better to get your horizontal, uh, your lateral lines in and get your gas capture going from as early as possible. But that also means that these uh, these pipes that are under the ground are going to end up under quite a profile of waste. You know, and if you think about the the amount of weight that ends up on top of laterals that are in the lower lifts um, early on, you know, they probably uh, started with a, a, a lower grade design. But now, as we've improved our technologies, we know and we um, we align the horizontal wells and use a, a thickness of pipe that is more suitable to um, you know, the profile of waste that goes on top of them if you're putting laterals in the, the lower ends of your line. But you can sort of expect to get around about 10 years or so um, out of a, a lateral installation. So you get a really decent return on investment for the ability to get in there early and get your gas capture going as early as possible. Okay, question number six. I would love to know about the impact of landfill gases or leachate on soil and what is best practice? So um, this harks back to the question about how damaging methane is. So uh, if you have lateral migration of methane through the soil profile, which can be um, usually within dissolved gases, uh, sorry, within, dissolved within um, liquids, but uh, methane will actually displace oxygen um, in confined spaces. So what can happen is you, your soil pores uh, can fill up with methane that displaces the oxygen and your tree roots don't have the oxygen they're required to, to, uh, to survive. So you actually do get dieback and vegetation and it's one of the key indicators when you're looking for fugitive emissions um, with from lateral migration is and you see lots of vegetation die back in particular areas and that's where you know you're having uh, lateral migration problems. What it also does is um, the, the roots of trees don't tend to like to grow towards places that the you know, environments that are not conducive to growth. So if you have a lateral migration problem, you're going to 
uh, end up getting very shallow roots and you'll find you'll have uh, trees that fall over very easily because their roots don't have the space to grow. So it's really important to, you're going to have a nice buffer of trees around your landfill to manage your landfill gas really well, otherwise you're going to have problems with your vegetation buffer. And what about the leachate element? Do you want to talk to that? Uh, leachate migration through soils. Um, obviously, leachate contains all sorts of nasties, um, heavy metals and nice biologicals, things like that. Again, you know, it, there's uh, migration of, of uh, nitrogen through soils. You can get overgrowth of uh, bacteria, which consumes oxygen. And again, you make a deoxygenated area and you have vegetation die back. Um, you get transport of heavy metals. It's really, really not a nice, not a nice situation. So, um, you know, the, the two things that your landfill produces, your landfill gas and your leachate, you really need to be actively managed to ensure that you don't get environmental damage occurring. The other one is just, you know, the dissolved solids themselves. You know, salt mm -hmm. in the end is a is a problem Absolutely. if you're discharging, sometimes forgotten. Next question, what opportunities are there for using the heat generated from gas flares? Is it ever used for leachate evaporation? That's a good question. Yeah, so over the progression of um, technologies in the level gas space, there's, there's lots of places that we've gone with, um, with the, the use of, uh, secondary use of heat that's generated. Um, also using the actual gas to directly evaporate the chain. So there's uh, some providers out there. I know that um, Benetera actually use landfill gas within their system. Um, LGI uh, have partnered with um, Benetera at a, at a site recently to use, to supply gas um, from our system into the, the leachate evaporation. So it's a really exciting space. There's definitely more technologies that can come on board to, to use the light and heat or to use the gas for, for beneficial reuse purposes. Question, best way to monitor fugitive landfill gas? Look, we might skip over that one. Um, we have covered that previously in other webinars. So um, there are several techniques you can use continuous monitors, you can use spot measurements, uh, you can use drones. Um, so we might cover that in, a, in another one. Um, question nine, some comment on the use of compost biofilter layers, effectiveness, best practice design. Yeah, so, uh, so LGI isn't particularly in, in the compost or biofilter space. We're, we're more in the active gas space, but there is some really, um, really exciting research and some um, biofilters that are in place and being used at the moment. Um, I would I would really sort of suggest that you have a, have a chat to some of the, the, the researchers who work on these biofilters because they have a, a really good handle on 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 them. We've been involved in a couple of studies there, including a, a project to design a monitoring system to assess the effectiveness of that. Um, so perhaps if uh, that person wants to shoot us an email, I can come back with a bit more detail on that. Um, next question. Are there viable remote sensing solutions for monitoring fugitive emissions in landfill? Uh, yes, there are. There's drones that are being used. In terms of satellites, I'm not sure. Victoria, do you have any knowledge around the use of satellites for this? So I, I, I'm not certain on the, um, the sensitivity of satellites for, for landfill gas monitoring other than um, for identifying the point source of emissions. I'm not sure that they go down to being able to actually locate, say, a crack in a cap to understand where repairs need to be made. But the, the satellites are um, being used, I know, particularly in the States for identifying um, the point source so that there is a landfill and that it is producing fugitive emissions, but not particularly down any sort of uh, lower, more finer scale than that. 
it would be interesting to understand the resolution they're getting to because I know it's, you know, these days we can use it for looking at pretty small movement in dam walls and things. So mm. um, I might have a look into that. Uh, next question, what types of odorous gases such as mercaptans and carcinogens are in our tip gas? Mm. Yeah, look, uh, I guess the, the one that everybody's fairly um, familiar with is the, the hydrogen sulfide. That's the nice sort of rotten egg smell you get when you're, you're close to a landfill that isn't being managed too well. Or, um, so that tends to be uh, generated particularly from landfills that have high um, construction and demolition wastes. Um, there's sulfur reducing bacteria in there that convert you know, your gypsum from your um, fiberboard, plasterboard uh, in the right conditions into the hydrogen sulfide. And that really sort of messes with landfill gas sensing systems. But um, the temperatures that we run our flares at, um, you know, it's it's hitting hitting the flame at a thousand degrees. So we are really, you know, doing a lot of destruction of not just the methane, but these other um, components within the landfill gas stream. So we, we do testing, stack emissions testing to ensure, um, you know, to, to measure these type of, uh, of compounds that come out as well. But during the commissioning side of things, is there, a, you know, do you go through a really high level of rigor um, in terms of looking at a, I guess a really broad range of contaminants that might be coming out. It's a we we do stack emissions testing, we do bag testing, uh, particularly when we, we first uh, construct a, as a manufacturer as we first construct, and then um, you know we do them on site as well. The the tough thing with emissions profiles or contaminants of concern is that they can be incredibly broad um, and. Uh, a lot of the time, we have to have standards to be able to match these um, contaminants against, and, uh, against. and uh, quite often we don't have the analytical testing processes to really understand, um, you know, and the sensitivity and the tests to actually get down low enough to, to see them in their you know, parts per billion um, levels. So it's a, it's, a, it's a balancing act between ensuring that we're managing you know, the, the methane and the, the componentry, the landfill gas that we know are really, really harmful. And then looking at these very small levels of other things that are, that are also in there. But it's obviously something that um, as an industry and, and within the chemistry space that we, we need to continuously improve on and always look towards um, ensuring that we are uh, doing our best with our environmental profile. Congratulations, Victoria. You've got through the early bird questions. <laughs> now we're moving to the Q&A side of things. Um, we have 20 questions here. That means one minute per question, roughly <laughs> by two o'clock. So we'll see how we go. First question, how do you evaluate the performance of gas extraction? Uh, so we we take the waste data um, that we supplied from the landfill operator and we put that into the model and we look at what we are expecting to get out of the landfill and then we look at what we do get out of the landfill and we ensure you know that we are um, looking at the the right level of gas extraction. Um, we monitor all of our equipment at every at every level, so we ensure that all of our, our uh, gas lines are. Uh, operational so that we can get the best extraction out. Um, we always try and make sure that uh, we have a profile of wells that are in and that uh, there's enough active wells within areas to be capturing to the best ability. Um, we do very regular monitoring so some uh, depending on the age and the type of waste there's a, a different requirement for how often you will need to go out and do your tunes. So we look really carefully. We know probably more about your landfill than uh, we're really, you're really comfortable that we know. <laughs> okay, so that question was from Natasha Vella. Thanks, Natasha. Next question's from Bettina Zimmerman. 
a lot of operational landfill licenses, including the ones amended under the new EPA Act, do not necessarily request landfill gas extraction. Uh, and then there's another, I think, uh, part to that question. Would a recommendation from an environmental auditor be sufficient to get the landfill gas extraction requirement included in a license? Um, look, this is this is where, as an industry, we need to be working um, really carefully together because if we go ahead and, and use the stick and put it, uh, you know, a, a really hard reference to regulating landfill gas extraction, we make it a lot harder for these these councils and landfill operators who, um, you know, maybe working on these tight budgets. Um, to be able to install these systems um, under the, the uh, federal funding schemes that we have available. So I think it's really the, the point that I would really like to see is to have as many operators proactively seeking and installing these systems as soon as they can. Um, and then, you know, have a, have a communication with the industry and say, look, you know, you've got a couple of years to sort this out. And after that time, we're going to regulate uh, and then that makes sure that you know, where, where we can, we've got as, as effective um, um, saturation of the, the landfill network as we can. But it's about making sure that we're not just putting a huge amount of onus on, on the councils um, to, to put these systems in. You know, they, they are quite pricey. It's an interesting little gap in regulation, really, isn't it? Like it really is, yeah. It doesn't make much sense. Uh, you would have thought that the audit process around licences, you know, that annual review would be leading to a more timely sort of catch-up. Um, so the, there's a the challenge there to the auditors, uh, time to fill the gap, <laughs> I guess. Um, I just want to make one more comment in that, that section there is that uh, the way that the regulation is set up at the moment and the funding is set up, is that because we're generating these A6EUs, we are incentivized to chase the gas to our absolute best of our ability. So if you regulate and you say to somebody, you have to put a gas system in, there is, you run the risk of, of getting a, you know, just a basic system that may not be capturing you know, the absolute maximal amount of gas it can do. So we just need to bear that in mind too. Another little question related to this is um, you mentioned earlier, once the regulation mandates a certain, um, I guess, management of this gas, then we lose some of the benefit of having a low bar at the moment. If an order to make a recommendation associated with a particular site to put in a landfill gas capture system, are we lifting the bar and therefore they can't claim as much improvement? I think it's the, the regulatory burden threshold. So I, I think it's, it's got to be a licensing requirement. It's a little bit of gray area at the moment. Um, I would like to see the, the communication and maybe just the, the recognition of the landfill operators. Um, this needs to come in as a priority and there's there's other ways other than auditing to get that in there and I'm, I'm looking to your sustainability managers and your waste strategy um, consultants you know it's uh, it's a it's a crime in the you know 2023 that we were going through this process of looking at our long-term waste strategies and, and they still don't have reference to landfill gas extraction and then you know, it should be something if a council is, uh, you know, spending 60% of its greenhouse gas quota on landfill gas emissions, there should be a, a reference to landfill gas in their sustainability programs. So there's, there's many levels at which we can look at this problem. It actually sounds like something that WAMA could take on, you know, uh, on behalf of... Oh, WAMA. Mm. WAMA are fervent supporters of landfill gas. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, come on, Wemmer. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks for those questions, Patina. Next question is from Joe McLean. What factors influence how deep? Whoops, I think we might have deleted. I uh, know oh, there. Yeah. What? What factors influence how deep the wells should be? 
Um, that's a great question. So not only are you looking at um, ensuring that your zones of influence sort of align really well, but you need to look at your waste depth, and that's uh, particularly looking at the geometry of your landfill when you're doing your design. So when you're installing wells, um, the, the number one thing is to protect your liner. Um, so if you've got a, um, a HDP liner or a composite line cell, you want to make sure that your wells go down to a depth where you're not going to um, puncture that line or, or have any you know, force waste into it. So you normally stop short of the liner. Um, that depends on you know, who's, who's doing your, your um, design and construction. And there's a few different values around the different regulations. You sort of um, give a, a few metres of, of space to make sure you're not going to hit it. Um, if you've got a, a clay-lined landfill or a, a landfill where you um, maybe have a bit of a legacy issue where it didn't have a liner at all, you want to probably be extracting as much gas as you possibly can um, because the risk of that gas migrating outweighs the risk of you uh, you touching the, the soil at the bottom, the, the clay at the bottom. So you would probably go as close to full depth as, as you, your uh, operator feels comfortable. Right, the next question is an anonymous one. What's your experience with horizontal extraction lines and settlement? Are they a long-term solution or do they get compromised over time? What we're seeing um, with the, the way that landfill operators have improved their operation techniques, you know, our compaction rates are getting a lot better than they used to be. So your differential sediment profile is um, not as, as great. So if you have a, you know, a lift of reasonably uncompacted waste, you get this going on and um, your lateral lines, you have to put quite a bit of fall on them so that you don't end up with um, condensate buildup and things like that. But as we improve our landfilling practices, um, we improve the, the management of our, our lateral installations. So you always install them to, you know, to the best of your ability, your time, and they, they will fail. There's, you know, all, all of these uh, pieces with the landfill do eventually fail from aging or sun damage or uh, um, differential settlement, but it's getting that longevity out of them before you have to do a redrill. So it's, it's really about um, managing that in line with your compaction and operation side of things, which is why the communication with your landfill operator is so typical. Related question a little bit further down. So how often is it maintained and how are the blockages identified? So um, that's a that's a fairly fairly common thing is to, to have blockages in these systems. Um, you'll usually pick them up when you do your tuning. So you'll um, notice that your, your suction pressure is building, but maybe your gas levels are decreasing. So that sort of indicates blockages in the system. Um, a lot of the time, you can actually attend site, and if you can hear the sea, um, you can you tell that they're surging in a line. It actually sounds like the ocean coming in. Uh, the waves coming in and out. So that's a good indicator that you've got condensate build up. Um, you can look at actually just the lay of your, your system. You know, have you got a differential settlement occurring and you've got a big bow in it, you can pretty much guarantee that there's going to be condensate building up in the, the bottom of that bow. Um, so it's really about monitoring and maintaining your landfill done to, to recognise when you've got blockages um, and then going back and, and fixing those. So a blockage may be something as simple as a well filling up with leachate and then you, you work with your landfill operator to, to help them um, reduce their leachate. So that could be, um, you know, trucking it offside or that could be doing a bit of recirculation to, to get your, your methanogenesis back up. Um, and then you've reduced your leachate volume and your well comes back online and you'll see that when you go and do your regular monitoring. Um, uh, it may be sediment buildup, so you're never going to get back from, from that one. You've blocked your, you've blocked your well, it's full of, full of sediment. Um, so that would probably require a redrill. Uh, when you redrill your wells, you've got to be mindful about your zones of influence. There's no point in putting a, a, a new well next to another well that's already operating because you'll end up with competing vacuum. Do you have much trouble with perching of leachate sort of in 
discrete layers that might clog up these story of my life um, absolutely so uh often the older landfill practices meant that the the um, day cover wasn't stripped off between layers um, the installation of landfill gas systems actually uh, can assist in those situations because we are drilling down through the cover material and you actually sort of pop that area. Um, so we have to be mindful when we're drilling about areas of pitch leachate um, and also it leads to a lot of dry waste if you've got quite thick layers of, of interim cover or day cover that's still within the, the um, landfill cell. It'd be interesting to get your take on how much leachate is perched in any landfill versus actually sitting down on the line. Uh, that would be a chat for another day. Um, next questions from John Lufton Steiner. We have a closed landfill site for approximately 20 years. It's been closed with three cells that have some passive gas vents. Would this be suitable? I'm suspecting the answer is Yes, Victoria would like to have a chat, <laughs> is that right? I would love to have a chat. Um, I want to give you an example of a, of a landfill that we um, have had a, a gas system on. It closed in 1997. Uh, it is 2023 now. We are still uh, extracting enough gas from that landfill to power an engine. So landfill gas happens for a very long time. Um, when you look at a lot of the, the development of the early gas models, one of the interesting things you'll see is they, they don't have any timeframes on them. They just have uh, composition ratios. And I think we're getting to this piece now where we're starting to understand how far out that gas production actually goes. So it's, it's definitely worth um, talking to your landfill gas um, provider and, and getting another assessment done for sure. Well, we'll send through John's contact details, Victoria. Um, next question is from William Dillon. Is it viable to install a land for gas extraction system on a legacy bracket unlined landfill, which which is predominantly saturated with leachate? <laughs> Um, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, again, I'm going to come back to the piece of we, yeah, irrespective of what it is, you should get an assessment about whether it's um, the right geometry for um, landfill gas extraction for closed cells. So with the, uh, the installation of vertical wells, you, you, know, you really want to be getting a decent uh, height of, of piping into the waste. So if you've got a, an old shallow landfill, they tend to not be particularly great for, for gas extraction. Um, but quite often these landfills, these old landfills were backfills and quarries and things. Um, so they, they tend to be quite suitable for, for gas extraction. It doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, a real requirement for having a liner on the bottom because we just modulate the amount of vacuum applied to make sure that we're targeting the waste and not pulling uh, oxygen in from outside of that the, the waste cell. So in that sort of situation where it is saturated, would you also put in some kind of a leachate dewatering? system and recirculate it or how would it's you do that? Absolutely great opportunity to deal with a wet landfill um, and manage the landfill gas at the same time. So there um, the multi-purpose vertical wells that you can put in and I know that there's uh, um, a lot of technologies out there there's some really um, smart pumps that go into landfills that can be solar powered or they can be gas driven so you don't have to have mains power to, to pump out your leachate. Um, a lot of the time the challenges with removing leachate from those type of, uh, of landfills is if the landfill is already saturated you know you don't want to be probably recirculating too much you want to be taking that off site and dealing with it. Um, you know, so it's, it's storage capacity and transport where the, those 10 things tend to fall down in terms of cost benefit. Um, but the infrastructure itself would give you an opportunity to deal with both of those uh, products in one go. 
if you want to see a good example of that, there's one on our website, actually, solar powered leachate extraction system. Um, there's a little plug. Next <laughs> question, anonymous attendee. To cater for any low flows or nil flow, do you need to have a standby pilot volume to ensure flame is always burning? So this is about um, sort of matching your landfill gas production rate to your wood structure equipment. So um, this is really up to your landfill gas provider to make sure that they have the most appropriate flare size for the volume of gas that your landfill is being produced. Um, the flare size um, really comes down to the burner, burner configuration to make sure that your burners are set up in the appropriate orientation to be able to manage the flow rates that are coming out. Um, the, the flows are balanced against the methane um, requirements. So if you are having a, a quite a high carbon dioxide percentage um, in your gas extraction, you're actually going to put the flat and your flare out you know, carbon dioxide, we, we use it in our fire extinguishers to smother flame. So it's really about finding that balance. Um, and that all comes down to, to your tuning, your technicians going out and tuning the field, um, ensuring that you've got sufficient wells and waste and planning for what's going to happen after your, your active extraction system isn't suitable to support a flame. Um, you know, there's, there's things like intermittent flaring or you can use a, a top-up gas, which kind of is a bit counter counterintuitive. Um, you know, if you're using these as a carbon abatement source, you don't really want to be bringing in, you know, natural gas to burn with your gas to burn your other gas because, you, you know, you're doubling your problem there. Sounds like doubling the accounting problem too. Um, <laughs> so with these intermittent flares, you've got a continuous monitor running, do you, or...? Um, that would be um, sort of a scenario where, um, you know, the rate at which your waste is producing gas is sort of too low to support a continuous flame. So if you have your wells turned down low, the gases will build up in your landfill and, and sort of give you a bit of a sugar hit that you would combust. Um, but it's not really an area that we are sort of sitting in as a, as a company because we really want to be doing an active gas extraction on, on landfills. Right. Um, all right. Next questions from James Stewart. Are we going for time? We're bang on two o'clock now. Um, might just charge through a few of these. Uh, if that's all right, Victoria, can you give us another 10 sure. minutes? Certainly. There's still uh, about uh, 60 odd people on, so a lot of interest. Um, are any landfill gas projects in Australia issuing credits other than ACUs? Oh, I missed one. Yep. So this is, I, I believe this is probably sitting in the, the realms of whether you're generating power and you are generating those large generation certificates where you're using the renewable energy um, to displace the, the carbon-based energy into the grid. And so, yeah, I believe, I believe a lot of the... Um, energy-based projects would be would be doing that. And whose job is it to work that out? Like for the customer, is that done by yourselves or? Um, that's a, absolutely a service that that LGI does. We can do you know packaging of, of that type of thing. Um, there's consultants out there that, that do that as well. So it's really up to the the um, the landfill gas operator. I mean, it's it's a a nice concise system if you're operating and um, you maintain the, the control of the data within the system uh, to do the reporting as well. Otherwise, it gets a bit piecemeal between you know, sending data and analysing data and lots of pieces. So we tend to prefer to, to, to package that all up. Yeah. Okay, next question going back. How commonly... Oops. How commonly are siloxane removal systems installed on landfill gas systems? And what is your view on the future of siloxanes as a potential contaminant of concern with respect to regulation? Yeah, look, um, 
So we, siloxane removal systems obviously add an additional cost to a lab gas um, installation. Um, they, you, what you would do is you would assess the, the gas input quality first to make a decision about whether you needed an SRS on, on your landfill gas system. Um, and so particularly for the really, uh, really old stable landfills, they tend to have lower siloxane levels just for the different um, types of waste that went in, you know, in the really old waste. Uh, I would say probably for, for newer landfills, you're looking at a higher contaminant profile just with um, the types of waste that go in the, in the ground. But it's, it's definitely a case of assessing your, your landfill case by case as to what it requires. Right. And who does that assessment? Is that yourselves? Or? Um, we, can, we, we can do that, absolutely. So we would, we would look at it during the, the flaring, um, the start of the project and, and assess it. How long does that feasibility sort of side of things take before people, like you mentioned, you could get a project up and running in six months. Does that include that side of thing? So um, how it sort of tends to work is that we would in, um, get a, a flare installation set up and going. Um, in terms of getting engines on onto a site, uh, there's additional timeframes around that. So you know you can pretty much assess the, the quality of your gas flows and the stability of your gas flow and fuel in a short space of time. But with an engine, you have to remember that there's that additional network connection piece that is usually what takes a, a, you know, a vast portion of the time of getting an engine onto a site. Um, when we are assessing the viability for putting engines on site, we have to look at uh, the actual location of the engine in comparison to where it needs to go into the network. You know, do we need to install new poles and new wires, upgrade the lines? Um, is it safe to do? There's a, there's a big piece there. There's sort of a side piece which we haven't really discussed at this point, which is um, the ability to deliver energy to adjacent uh, co-located facilities behind the meter. Um, so, for instance, at a, at a site in Queensland, we, they're flaring the landfill gas, converting that gas to air, electricity, and we're supplying a uh, sewage treatment plant, which is right next door to the landfill. Um, so we're using most of that energy to, to power that plant, which reduces the, you know, the, the energy costs for the, for the council using its own landfill as a resource to, to manage its wastewater treatment. That's, that's, you know, that's a really impressive sort of project, isn't it? So in that instance, um, were you proactive in terms of sourcing how the power could be used or they had another consultant involved in looking at the reuse of, or the, the use of the power. So, so this, is, uh, this is part of the project development, and part of getting an assessment on site. So for your, your landfill contractors, we won't just look at how much your landfill um, is producing. We, we, look, we look at it as a resource and an asset. We look at what else you could do with it. But it's, you know, there, there's a lot of buy-in from a lot of parties when you're looking at these co-located facilities. And you, you've got to have uh, good relationships within your council if you're looking to supply behind the meter um, or your neighbours, those type of things. Um, okay, the next question I think is from Keith Osborne. Could you please give more details on how siloxanes are removed? Also, what other gas impurities are removed prior to methane use? Um, I, I love the question. Um, it's, a, it's actually a proprietary technology that we have as a, as a business, so I can't go into it too much. But in essence, um, there's, a, there's a media bank that we have. Um, and then once that's full, then we uh, flare that off that, and uh, convert the side of the siloxanes um, so that they're not in the, the exit gas stream. So. so if you want to know, you'll have to engage Victoria for a project, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we, we love to take people around and, and show them, uh, you know, these setups. So feel, feel free to get in touch if you want to come and do a site tour and have a look. It's a really, really interesting. Fair enough to Victoria. Next question is from a hydrogeologist, Rod Harwood. One of the issues is the condensate management. 
Um, how many landfill use recovery wells do you require to increase the drawdown and maximise gas production? Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure where we were going with that one. In terms of, of condensate management, um, there's it really depends on the license of the site, um, whether you can put the condensate back into the landfill or whether it needs to go to a treatment plant. Um, quite often, larger landfills will have some kind of on-site treatment or they have a relationship with the sewage treatment plant. Um, with your condensate, the, the condensate can actually form a bilayer system. Um, you know, the, the organics, volatile organics come out. And there's some issues with um, hydrocarbon content sometimes in terms of being able to put that back into the landfills, but it's, we just have to manage it as it comes through. It's really dependent on the operator's management of leachate and um, the, the fuel capacity of the, of the waste as to how often and how bad the, the condensate impacts are. Okay, I'm wondering if it was about condensate or more about um, leachate drawdown, but um, mm. we'll move on. Um, hmm, suggestions and resources for lobbying local councils to install landfill gas systems now. Victoria, you would know <laughs> this from both sides of the fence. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I, in terms of, of lobbying, look, we... we We've always come out and, and have a chat to anybody at any level because I think the, the, the missing key in the landfill gas piece is just um, is just exposure and understanding about what these systems can do, what they mean for your emissions profiles, what they mean for your environmental um, impact, and what they can do as a, as a revenue generation source. So to me, landfill gas has something for everybody. You know, there's something for the, the environmental people who want to leave a better legacy. There's, there's something for the, the technology nerds who, you know, get into the power side of things or they want to see technology um, implemented on these sites. There's something for the people and the businesses who want to sit in the carbon space, but they, they want to look at the integrity of their carbon credits and, and the, you know, the fact that landfill gas is a, is a tangible, measurable ACCU, you know, there's all sorts of things that we can talk to, you know, and we're happy to talk about it and we participate in technical working groups and we try and get out to these conferences as much as we can to, to get the profile up. Just as a little lateral thinking moment, um, crowd, you know, you've got these various funds that have mandate to purchase green or, or you know invest in green green systems or infrastructure um did your do you ever get investment from those sorts of things like even you know sometimes they're a subset of a super fund or that sort of thing is there a way of accessing that sort of funding as and, oh. and do these things make enough money for there to be a reasonable return for them Probably a pretty tricky question to answer, actually. Yeah, I I sort of sit more in the technical space as opposed to the, the finance space. Um, but we we have a, a an in house economist who manages the, the the carbon pricing side of things and the, the broking type uh, interactions that we we have with the external brokers. Um, you do actually have to have a financial services license to buy and sell ACCUs. Um, so you've got to you've got to be aware that it's not as just not just as easy as uh, getting one of these projects registered and getting your carbon credits. You, you've got to be able to do something with them at the end of that. Um, in terms of partnering with um, you know the sort of the the larger green groups and things, I I I couldn't really talk to that in terms of our business. I'm not sure that we do that. Um, I remember talking to one of your former colleagues at the conference and mentioned that one of the barriers was actually you can't really have one of these financial services types on your panel but you sort of need them on the panel to get these projects executed which um it's kind of interesting as a 
as a, uh, a potential barrier to some of this. Um, better keep moving, though. Chris Ford, given the stated improvements in landfill gas extraction technology in the past few decades, is the greater than 100 metres cubed per hour gas generation rate in the Victorian Bepham still a valid lower limit to explore feasibility of active extraction? And this is a this is a really good question, a very very topical. Um, I know at the moment with the review of the, the length of gas method, um, if you have a look at all the research out there, there's just this wild varying array of uh, cubic meters of you know tons of methane per cubic meter of waste. Um, I think I, I think the range that I've seen is somewhere from from six to two hundred and seventy, um, and that is purely down to the fact that it is such a complex um, complex system within a landfill because you have waste from different generations um, that is aging at a different rate and it's been uh, put into a landfill using you know varied improvements and methodology so it's incredibly hard to to really predict how much methane uh, a, a complex mixed landfill is you can look at it outside in a lab setting and say you know this much um, this much weight of, of organic waste produces this, this much methane but you know when you mix that up with you know a table and chairs and some nappies and a whole pile of concrete and some asphalt and you know all sorts of things are you know there's there's no there's no quick and fast answer to that unfortunately um, what we as an industry are looking into is this concept of capture efficiency so we're taking the data that we currently have um, and we're looking at the model and we're going, all right, how much did the model predict and how much did we predict that we should have been able to capture with our landfill gas system? And having a look, you know, what, what does that figure look like? Is it 50%? Is it 80%? Is it 150%? Um, and there, there is that range, you know, there's, there's a number of sites that we have that our capture efficiency is really high and, you know, above the, the, the predicted model range. So, we are now in this phase of reviewing the data that we have and um, you know, potentially looking to, to improve how we, how we um, do the calculation side of things. Very good. Now I'm just going to get a little bit selective because we're not keeping up. This Sorry, I'm cheating chatting a bit too much. No, no. <laughs> so some of these I feel we've sort of answered already. Um, there's a Good one here. Do smaller scale systems exist that are designed to manage odor production only? I guess odor emissions. That's, that's a good question. Um, I know that um, H2S generation and high CMD waste um, is, a, is a real issue for um, landfill gas providers. Uh, we see it a lot when we have um, high levels of, say, flood waste. We, we've had a number of demolished buildings sort of, sort of put in the same area within a landfill, and then you get this real big hit of H2S generation. Um, H2S is, is not fun to, to manage with, with landfill gas systems because it, it really upsets your, your, your senses, um, and it's parts per billion odorous, so you only have to have a small amount, and if you're generating a lot of it, it becomes very, very hard to manage. It also produces I don't know, acidic um, uh, acids and, and can do a lot of damage to equipment, so I, I don't know of any specific odor uh, management systems that, that sit in the lamp of gas space, unfortunately. Okay. Next question from Otmar Coleman, or Coleman, Otmar, I'm not sure. <laughs> I heard in the discussion that methane displaces oxygen when it comes to lateral migration in soil, hence resulting in vegetation dieback. Is this possible because methane is a lighter gas than oxygen? Uh, the short answer is yes, it happens. Um, in terms of the mechanism of concentrations and that sort of thing. Victoria, do you have a better explanation? Um, partial presses, gas migration. Um, no, I think it's it's as simple as it just 
you know, you can only put as much gas in a, in a particular fuel space and something has to displace something and oxygen goes first. Yeah. Thank you. Um, are there different subsidy regimes for flaring versus power generation? Um, the, the nice thing is that uh, methane is methane whether you burn it in an engine or whether you burn it in a flare. Um, the difference between the two is the, the destruction efficiency um, calculation. So um, flaring you said about 98% um, and engines, I think they, they run them as a, um, a full 100% in the calculation, but it's, it's not, a, not a noticeable difference, no. And uh, I think you mentioned earlier there's a calculator. So um, Natasha's asking, is there a tool or calculator to work out whether your landfill would benefit from a flare or energy generation system? Um, there is not, not a, a calculator for, for that because you really have to understand the parameters of the, the engine or whatever the destruction system you want to put on there. So, I mean, you could do a, a base sort of calculation if you if you looked at whatever your engine was and what it required and match that to the, the gas um, capture and, and production calculator, you could sort of do a bit of a rough, but the best thing you can do is just have a, have a chat to um, the companies that run these systems and, and, and um, they, can, they can do that work for you based on their experience. We're going to make this the last question. <laughs> but Victoria, you've been fantastic. Thank you for all your extra time. So congratulations to Edward Sorrigan for being the lucky last question maker. Guess what? He's got three questions. <laughs> We're going to bundle them together. So it says, you must take all practicable measures to prevent emissions of landfill gas from exceeding the action levels specified in Table 6.4, these are the EPA VIC regs, right? This mm -hmm. is out of the, Be the BEPM. And then it states, uh, practical measures include, but are not limited to installing and running a landfill gas extraction system. And then Edward says, therefore, Victorian EPA licenses do require landfill gas capture and treatment. Yeah. We, um, as, as a business, don't actually have um, landfill gas extraction in, in Victoria at the moment. We spend a lot more of our time sort of in the New South Wales, ACT, Queensland region. So I would probably, you know, I would probably ask one of the operators who are operating down in Victoria that question um, around how they're managing that within their business model um, for, for, a, for a more precise answer to that. Sorry, I couldn't, couldn't go any further than that for you. I would hate to speculate. Can't believe the last question. We're going to have to phone a friend. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much, Victoria, for everyone. And also to everyone who's turned up today and those fantastic questions. We will come back to those people whose questions we didn't get time to answer today. But um, I really do think that's probably a record number of questions we've answered in one session but many thanks Victoria for presenting today I thought that was fantastic and uh, that will be it for today so thanks very much everyone for turning up that's great thanks Richard